I thought I was initially just going to talk about Kelsen and Scalia, but then I thought, no, I've got to push back on uh, this uh, claim from, uh, from Fred about Hugo Black not having a constitutional theory. I mean, really. Uh, so here is uh, Hugo Black in uh, a constitutional faith. Uh, uh, he uh, rests his constitutional theory on the Article Six oath. Uh, that oath uh, means to me that I should support the Constitution as written, not as revised by the Supreme Court from time to time. Um, and he, uh, yeah, he's writing in 1968. He's not, uh, doesn't have the benefit of, uh, you know, Larry Solom and, and, and all of us, but, um, you, you know, it, it, he, he, he did have the benefit of, uh, you know, the insights that Sutherland and Cooley and Jacob Howard had in, in rooting uh, constitutional theory that way. Um, I thought, I thought the paper was fascinating. I would have preferred that you uh, have this stuff directly about interpretation first. Uh, so kind of standard comment, maybe you should chop this paper into two. The, some of them, a couple of the moves, like around 50 to 51 to, to, to two, struck me as a little quick. Um, and this may be because you were thinking of Scalia as the only exemplar. Um, so I would say that originalism is neither necessary nor sufficient for at least restrained judging. So um, it, it sets what the constitutional truth maker is, but you can set that in a way if you don't know it well enough and you're willing to, to you know, let judges uh, speculate about it, uh, it could be very, very, very unrestrained. Um, so that definition I thought was, was you, know, you kind of in the background there. And then a couple pages later you say, oh, Kelsen was into uh, looking at policy uh, questions uh, and, and uh, the, the, the rights of the, of the matter rather than just what the words express. Uh, it seems like uh, Scalia certainly would be upset with that, uh, or at least the Scalia of late June 2008 when he's writing Heller uh, would be upset with that. But what about the Scalia of early June 2008, uh, his Boumediene uh, uh, dissent where he says, look, the fact that more Americans will be killed uh, by this interpretation of the habeas corpus, uh, uh, the suspension clause, uh, is a relevant consideration. Seems like the, uh, at times he was, uh, uh, took the attitude that uh, Marshall had in 1805 in U.S. versus Fisher, when the law is unclear, you can engage in moral reasoning, reasoning about natural rights uh, as a method of, of clarifying things. Uh, so if we do that, won't we all be, uh, can't we all get along? Uh, First, I'm just kind of wondering about how Kelson understands gaps in the law and the discretion of judges. Um, so it's been a while since I've read Kelson. I wondered if you could clarify how he reconciles the claim that law has no gaps with the idea that judges always have discretion. You know, again, like Fred was saying, uh, an act of application always equals an act of lawmaking. And I guess relatedly, I'm wondering um, about how he thinks of uh, the idea of uh, discretion, whether it's just occasional or is it, do they always have discretion? It seemed to me that you're saying he thinks they always have discretion. If so, then how can it also be the case that legislatures can minimize that discretion? Um, and I guess, you know, why does this matter in the paper? I think it matters maybe because uh, kind of more modern versions of uh, originalism do kind of distinguish between this first act of interpretation where we talk about the meaning of a statute and then also the second act where uh, we apply it to a specific situation, and I'm just wondering, again, how, how Kelson fits onto that. I want to make two points, one about constraint and one about Justice Scalia. Uh, so people in this room have justifiably um, been upset at liberals and progressives who are attacking originalism circa 1985 or something. Randy has um, said this many times um, in response to people. Uh, the constraint part of originalism original public meaning originalism as advocated by most people. Um, constraints, that's not a big part of it anymore. Uh, it was dropped in the 1990s. And I, and I think you have to be careful about thinking that today's originalists in America feel strongly about constraint. I think they feel, let's get the Constitution right, which is different than being constrained. Um, the second point I want, so I, I think you got to rethink that issue about originalism and constraint. Um, the second point is going to offend a lot of people, so I'm going to try to say it really carefully. Um, and slowly. If this were an American Constitution Society conference 
and the most famous liberal law professors in America were in the room, they would say to you that you picked the wrong person because Justice Scalia simply talked the talk of originalism but never acted like an originalist. So depending how you count, he, has struck, he struck down somewhere between 140 and 160 laws during his career. Um, and virtually, uh, it's like 5% of those, any originalist evidence was presented at all. Uh, that's point A. Point B, people like Richard Fallon, Ern Chemerinsky, and others, um, and me, um, have documented very precisely the huge range of constitutional law questions from which, uh, on which Justice Scalia was not an originalist. We can go from standing to free speech, even to separation of powers. Um, he's not a textualist because in Prince he says the text doesn't answer the question, but other things do, and I then wrote an incredibly shoddy opinion. So I, I'm, I'm just suggesting to you that there are a great bulk of thoughtful commentators in America who really do not believe he was an originalist at all when it came to deciding cases. And I suspect 20 years from now, that will be a well-accepted idea. Not yet, but it will be. The mythology of Justice Scalia, um, I just wrote a piece when in, in, in a law review in India, <laughs> dispelling the myths about Justice Scalia. Now, you won't hear that in this room unless two or three other people speak up. But that's a very commonly held view among the most prominent liberal law professors in America. He was not an originalist. He just talked to talk. And I will make just one point of order, just to clean the slate, so to speak. So as for gaps, Kelsen takes for granted there are gaps. And when, but when he does that, when he does a comment, he's thinking about foreseeability, which is very, very sound argument, seems to me. You cannot, you cannot foresee all the potential, all the possibilities, uh, when you, when you draft a law. And you must accept that. There's sort of realistic aspects within, within Kelsen's reasoning. So thanks for pointing that out because I think we can, we can distill that even more. Um, I understand as a, there's the elephant in the room, which is why we picked Scalia and why we analogize that to Kelsen. I see that. I understand that. But we just, we, we have a original sin. We, we do comparative law. So we start from the fact that people cite Scalia and cite Kelsen. They are just a matter of fact. So Hugo Black, Bantham, anyone. So, and of course, Bonaparte. And we, we don't disagree with, with you. We, we agree with the fact that they might not be the best examples, but that's a matter of fact that people are citing Scalia and increasingly so, even though Scalia was at, at least until 10 years ago, he was very famous for saying something like, Oh, Europeans, we don't care about them. And then you see Europeans citing Scalia. We, we, we are rather proud people and we, we often look down at, at the new world. So why do we cite someone who look down on us? That's because what we are, what we think we see into Scalia's writing, which might not be the case, but that's a matter of fact. So that's why we are playing with that. So actually, when you make, when you emphasize that we're looking into the wrong narration, it, it really helps us because it's something that adds up to the paper. Thank you. And, and just to clarify, I, I don't look down on you. And as a matter of fact, uh, so I get the descriptive claim that, uh, when people see judges doing things that seem crazy to them, they start looking around for some language to describe why that's wrong, and then originalism is sometimes the useful language to describe why that's wrong. Uh, but I guess I'm curious, is that theoretically the right way to go about it, or is that uh, the wrong way to go about it? So I might have thought that you know, how to interpret the Constitution, or whether Hans Kelsen has the correct theory of law, is an ex-ante question that's just true or not, and doesn't become more true just because judges are doing crazy things. It doesn't become less true if judges were doing more reasonable things 20 years ago, and that's true here too. So it might be sort of a, an interesting sociological fact about the academy uh, or lawyers that they discover these theories at these moments, 
but does it have any relationship to the validity of these theories? Like, we're, we're, shouldn't, shouldn't Europeans have been citing Scalia all along? I guess that's the question. I apologize for the potential philistinism of this question. Um, I have never encountered a discussion of Hans Kelsen that has made me want to read more of him. <laughs> and um, part of that is that I'm just uncertain as to the method. So for somebody like Hart, I kind of get what he's doing. He's trying to do descriptive sociology, talk about artificial normative systems like games and languages and fashion and etiquette and law. And that's how he lumps it in. For somebody like Finnis, he seems to be trying to do practical reasoning, like what should we actually do under these conditions with this very complicated social institution surrounding us and so on and so forth. What is Kelsen doing? What are the grounds of the many pronouncements that we hear about grunt norms and about gaps and frames and pictures? Like what makes those things true for him? What, how would you describe his approach and why somebody like me who's, who's skeptical should pay more attention? Um, I, I had uh, a comment about the description of, of Justice Scalia, which I, I think is a friendly comment. It's intended that way anyway. But uh, I think perhaps the, the description may be a little bit oversimplified in, in the sense that um, you, you say that um, at one point that Scalia thought there was a single right answer uh, for, for each point and that originalism would supply that single right answer. Um, I, I think that's not entirely true on two grounds. I think, first of all, Scalia did recognize that there were ambiguities that would, would not be, uh, that were just inherent in the language, and there were ambiguities there. That there's nothing you could do about that from an, as an originalist. And moreover, he recognized that um, because of the amount of time elapsed, that there would be uh, some parts of the Constitution that you just, you couldn't reconstruct, even if they once had a right answer, um, they, they didn't, uh, you wouldn't be able to get to them. So I think he was um, more realistic about the ability uh, to reach a single correct answer uh, than perhaps you, you give him credit for. Uh, I think what he saw in originalism uh, was a way of limiting discretion of judges, um, but not eliminating it. So I did he think he did recognize that justice judges nonetheless retained some discretion necessarily, and he had some other ideas about what to do about that problem. Um, but uh, I, I think this is a, a friendly uh, comment. It's meant to be because uh, I think it actually brings Scalia perhaps a little closer to Kelson uh, than your compare and contrast suggests and perhaps makes his uh, philosophy a little bit more palatable uh, to Europeans uh, and, and a little bit uh, less of a, of a caricature of, of American certainty uh, than, uh, than a claim that, that all answer, that all constitutional questions would in inevitably have a single correct answer. First of all, um, the validity of these theories. So both, um, Andrea and I, and if, if I'm, uh, summarizing incorrectly Andrea's, uh, thought, he can, he can, um, um, jump in whenever he wants, um, started from a certain discomfort with the evolutionary path of um, of uh, jurisprudence uh, in uh, in Europe, and we start we we uh, thought that uh, there was the need to understand the root of this evolutionary path because if you um, go to European uh, conferences, if you enter European universities, this is absolutely the mainstream in constitutional theory and practice. Um, and we wanted to explore uh, the, the root of that, but at, at the same time, we wanted to offer an alternative uh, to uh, those accounts. Um, our, our alternative, uh, and this is the part in which I am, I am um, replying to the question, should uh, 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 Europeans have started citing um, Scalia earlier? Um, we thought that a possible answer is to discuss more the merits of those interpretive theories that want to constrain um, the judiciary. And they want to constrain the judiciary, the judiciary to protect political deliberation, uh, not to. Uh, and this is uh, there was um, someone was was making a um, 
a distinction before uh, on what exactly is originalism uh, today about, is originalism about um, constraint, judicial constraint, or is originalism about, uh, let's uh, get the constitution right. Now, I think that the way Europe is trying to integrate the originalist the originalist debate is the first one, is judicial constraint, is trying to find the grounds for judicial constraint since for a long while judici- an unconstrained judiciary worked uh, in, in Europe. It, it worked. It, it produced results that were accepted by the legal community, they were accepted by the political community as well. So the point is to find arguments to uh, to to um, to justify uh, judicial constraints. They are not simply saying judici- judicial constraints is bad per se. Is bad to the extent in which it, it reduces the space for political deliberation. But then the two elements um, start to get connected because the political deliberation that should not be constrained is the political deliberation that is set free from the constitutional text. Um, uh, The question uh, concerning Kelsen, uh, well, and then I leave the floor to, to Andrea to answer uh, part of this question. But let me just say that um, the point, uh, the, the reason why uh, Europeans are so fascinated about Kelsen is are, are basically two. The, the first one is that Kelsen um, for sure influenced the structure of our legal systems and the way um, we think. Uh, and we solve um, um, interpreta- interpretative issues um, and, and theoretical issues in general. But most importantly, Kelsen tried to uh, purify uh, the, the, the law from, um, uh, from uh, history and from sociology in a, uh, in a, in a particular historical moment in Europe. Uh, in which then, as we say in the paper, he lost the battle in, in, in a sense. And this made, uh, Kelsen a sort of, um, foundational point of reference, um, for, for understanding, uh, European constitutional development. And when I say European constitutional development, I mean at the national level. Andrea, I think you want to... Yeah, but uh, I, won't, I won't take more time. Uh, I would just let everyone know that it, there's no other way to put it other than saying that Kelsen is boring. There's no <laughs> no other way to put that. So I, I understand the point that <laughs> might not be fascinating. Let me... If I can jump in um, here uh, also in response to the query about why Kelsen. So there's the um, the snarky response and the non-snarky response. Uh, my preference is always to start with the snarky one. Um, so um, three quarters of the wor- of the uh, legal academic world. Uh, um, almost all of continental Europe, almost all, uh, of Latin America and significant parts of Asia, uh, think, as Gabriella said, um, that Kelsen is the most important figure and it's what people start learning with. That view might be wrong, but it does create a pretty strong burden of proof to those who would want, um, to deny it. Uh, I'll leave it at that. The non-snarky response is that Kelsen gives us um, um, an account, it might be wrong, it might be obscure, it might be boring, of the relationship between law and other things in what lawyers and judges do. Um, And here uh, we see a lot of this in Joseph Raz as well. Remember, Kelsen is not, 
his, the title of his book, Notwithstanding, does not want, gives us, wants to give us a pure theory of law. But a pure theory of law is not a theory of pure law. Um, he does not believe that legal decision making, whether by judges, lawyers, or anyone else, is just about a narrower category called law. Uh, Roz makes the same point when he wants to distinguish between law uh, and legal reasoning. Um, and if we look uh, even at U.S. Supreme Court opinions uh, that are um, overwhelmingly uh, replete with empirical observations, asides about famous baseball players and a whole bunch of other things, um, we can ask, what work is law as law doing? And what work are various empirical propositions doing about the world, about politics, and so on? That's what Kelsen called sociology. He didn't think it was unimportant. He just didn't think it was part of this narrower domain of the comparative advantage of lawyers and judges. And the um, difficult issue um, of what is the relationship between, uh, let's call it formal law, uh, and the various empirical uh, and political propositions that dominate Supreme Court opinions uh, is a crucially important issue about which Kelsen uh, is not only a seminal thinker, uh, but extremely illuminating. Um, the obscurity of his prose, whether it be in translation uh, or not, notwithstanding. The focus on uh, Kelsen and Scalia is entirely appropriate. Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, respond very briefly to Eric Siegel. I think uh, Eric has misrepresented the state of originalist thinking about constraint. Originalists believe constraint is constitutive of originalism. I think Eric is really ac talking about an entirely different question, which is the extent to which the constitutional text is uh, determinate uh, or underdeterminate. And uh, that's a complicated question. But uh, most originalists believe that uh, the original meaning of the constitutional text is constraining and that the text is sufficiently determinant to provide a substantial amount of guidance to judges. Um, second point about the paper. So um, although I think it's wonderful to compare Kelsen and Scalia, there is a bit of a mismatch here. Uh, Kelsen has... Uh, uh, a very elaborate and articulated theoretical structure. And Justice Scalia, who uh, has done admirable theoretical work on originalism, uh, has nothing comparable. And there has been substantial development of originalist theory uh, since uh, uh, Scalia. So that if you want sort of to inform the European readers of your paper about the ways in which uh, contemporary originalism might relate to sort of the contemporary understanding of Kelsen in Europe, you might want to supplement the discussion of Scalia uh, with uh, some of the contemporary originalist theory. I think that uh, in many cases, you'll find that uh, some of the points of disagreement uh, that you identify between Scalia and Kelsen will be clarified, and some of them will be minimized if you sort of uh, compare the contemporary version of originalist constitutional theory with uh, 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 with current European understandings of Kelsen, I, I do think I do think Justice Scalia was an originalist, um, and I want to thank you for the illuminating suggestion 
which maybe it takes non-American scholars to arrive at and deliver, um, that he was un-American. Um, well, the question that I want to tee up for you is this. Originalism is not just one thing. Originalism is the surname of a family of approaches, theories, attitudes toward constitutional decision making. Um, there are originalists, right, like, like, like Larry, right, um, uh, right, conveyed by what he's just said, for whom constraint is constitutive and essential in originalism. There are other self-described, self-identified originalists who think originalism has some constraining force, but original, but constraint isn't the crux of the matter. Um, it, it's not, uh, it's, it's great advantage over other theories isn't its ability to constrain. In fact, it might not even constrain all that well relative to others. Um, there are people, right? There are people in this room who are identify as originalists who have that position. There are people in this room who identify as originalists and who don't identify as originalists who think that actually, um, originalism under some circumstances, like those obtaining the United States today, is actually largely a technology of legal change rather than of constraint, right? And so the question, and, and it seems to me that all of these things are possible postures. And so the question that I would tee up for you in this project is whether it's an opportunity to think about what are the circumstances under which it makes sense to think of a thing called originalism as a constraint or as valuable mostly for its constraining force, what are the circumstances under which that isn't what it is or what it's doing? Because the situation that you are addressing in Europe, right, from which arises this interest in originalism, is a different set of circumstances from the circumstances that Scalia faced here, right? What are the circumstances under which originalism is or isn't something with that particular relationship to constraint? I, I have been, I'm, I'm totally informed by this paper and learned a lot about what's happening on, on our, uh, uh, with our friends in Europe. And I just want to know a little bit more about that. So this is just a question. Uh, and so part of it is, you know, what is Europe is part of the question. And so, uh, because, you know, it's, is it a culture? Is it a continent? Is it particular countries? Is it the EU? Which courts are we talking about? And in particular, there are two things going on across the pond uh, that I pay more attention to, and I wouldn't be surprised if many around the table are more familiar with. And I just wanted to ask you how these two developments fit in with your th thesis uh, of, uh, of an increasing importance of constraint among of the judiciary in, in Europe. One is what's going on in Israel, where we had possibly the most unconstrained major judiciary in the world, brilliant but unconstrained, and of course with no written constitution. And currently the government, the popularly elected, even if unpopular in many quarters over here, government of Israel is trying to rein that in. And so I think that's a really interesting jurisprudential conflict, and I'm curious how that fits with your uh, thesis. Um, and then I also think about the UK Supreme Court, uh, which, you know, after centuries of having, you know, a particular style of, uh, of judiciary, suddenly they have a Supreme Court which looks very different. Uh, and much of what I think they did at the beginning was in, interpret Europe, EU law and force it down the throats of the unsuspecting uh, uh, Brits. And, and of course, that's not happening anymore. And so I'm kind of wondering, how does the UK Supreme Court fit within your uh, description? Uh, we will think about the the alternative framing. What are the circumstances under which originalism have success, has success? Um, but thanks for the suggestion. I'm going to reply to the last two points concerning Israel and the UK because I think they are they are um, very um, interesting and, and well connected to uh, the point we were trying to make in the paper. So what, what's going on in Israel um, is something that we have been experiencing in some uh, countries um, in, in Europe lately, uh, and namely in Poland, to, uh, to a different extent. 
and in a different um, um, political context, uh, which is a very strong reaction from government uh, and an attempt to undermine the legitimacy uh, of courts or restraining courts that have been identified as the uh, real um, engine uh, behind the success of the European Union project. The European Union project largely rests on courts applying EU law according to an interpretation given by the, the European Court of Justice way beyond what was initially written in the treaties. And this cooperation of national judges was was fundamental. So this attack to courts um, in Europe is always perceived as an attack to the European Union project because courts have been uh, crucial in the development of, of the European Union. And this is why um, talking about judicial restraint uh, in, in Europe has a complete different meaning and and, and consequences um, compared to the uh, situation in, in the US. So I think that what's happening in Israel, in a way, magnifies the, the consequences of um, celebrating courts without realizing to what extent they undermine um, political, uh, the space for political deliberation. And this has prompted um, uh, very um, strong and alarming responses um, in Europe before, uh, before what happened in Israel, which is something discussed nowadays uh, in Europe, but of course perce perceived as less uh, compelling and urgent than what uh, is going on and has been going on for a while in Hungary or Poland. Those are more depressing issues for, uh, for for the European Union. Now, concerning the UK, I think the situation in the UK is is, is quite different. Um, it's true that uh, ordinary courts in the UK were applying EU law and for sure um, helping and fostering integration, but I don't think that this can be said to the same extent um, about the UK Supreme Court. Uh, which I think played a less, um, a far less crucial role and has been, except for the Brexit, um, uh, the, the, the decisions concerning, uh, Brexit far more, uh, let's say, understanding of the position of the government than other courts in Europe would have been. Thanks. I guess I wanted to make a point just about Scalia and some ways in which he's actually uh, <laughs> a European. Um, so if you read in the, what is it, A Matter of Interpretation? What's, what's that the name of that book? Whatever the book is, uh, the smaller book. Um, he starts out contra you know, talking about the common law method and how, what great fun it is to, to imagine. Um, you know, designing these rules, and then he contrasts it with, with written law and suggests, you know, that's, that's another story. Now, if you sort of think about what he's saying there, you know, there's, there's two reactions. Some, some people get the reaction, he, he, he's just drawing a contrast. But another way of looking at Scalia is, is that uh, he really doesn't like the common law. You're not, you're not going to say it there, but, um, and uh, for whatever it's worth, um, he, he never wrote this up, but, but I'm, I'm told that when he was at a, a, a round table, he, he talked more about, <laughs> he, he expressed um, uh, skepticism about the common law idea. And you could see where that would be coming from with respect to Scalia. So, so that, that's sort of in part to, to think, oh, he, he was um, uh, maybe not entirely comfortable with the common law, maybe the modern common law as opposed to to, uh, to the classical one. Um, now that by itself is just a you know a small point, um, speculative I suppose. But there was also a side of Scalia's statutory interpretation which um, kind of resembled um, code interpretation. Um, so Scalia 
Scalia has the, the sort of odd opinion at, um, at one point, I don't remember the name of the opinion, where he, he says, well, we ought to be interpreting this term and it had to do with attorney's fees. And when interpreting this term, we ought to look at it and fit it into the whole corpus juris. Um, and uh, in fact, we look at the earlier usages of the term attorney's fees and other statutes and later usages of it in order to interpret how it meant, how it should be understood in um, that statute. Now, the, the later enactments by Congress um, arguably shouldn't have any effect for an originalist, but um, Scalia said something like that. So, so the, to, I guess the, 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 the point of these two comments is just to say that there was a kind of side to Scalia that I sometimes saw and felt um, which was sort of, you know, code-like, <laughs> being more comfortable with a kind of European-type situation. If in Europe rights are interpreted um, to be subject to proportional proportionality tests, then it seems to me that the original meaning, if that's the original meaning, is not going to be very constraining. Uh, you will you will have you know judges doing all sorts of things under the guise of doing proportionality um, uh, balancing of that sort, and that will be that will be the original meaning if that's the original meaning of those rights. So I you know originalism won't constrain if the norms are not themselves constraining. Um. Kelsen, uh, based upon my very uh, superficial knowledge, is a child of World War I Europe, um, a Europe in which the monarchies failed and were defeated in war by parliamentary democracies and America. Um, so his, the Constitution of 1920 that he helped to draft starts off with this startling populism. Law is what the people say, or law emanates from the people, period. That's the that's, that's like the preamble to the whole thing. This, this notion of um, radical populism divorced from customer tradition. Um, but, but the second period is, of course, as you mentioned, Europe after, after World War II. And the reason Kelsen loses is because, it seems to me, the most obvious reason is uh, what emanated from the people um, in, in post-World War I Europe wasn't all that good. So what you needed was people plus restraining institutions. And that's the thing that, that, that works in Europe. Whereas Scalia is a child of mid-20th century America, where you would say, how does, does majoritarian democracy produce good things? Hmm, let's see. End of the Great Depression, victory in World War II, effective restraint of the Soviet Union, um, enormous prosperity. Majoritarian democracy works. So Scalia is going to think more like Kelsen, uh, and maybe even with more experience. Um, but the fourth is because you all point to the, the situation in our time. Um, I wonder if there's, there, there's no longer a new convergence between Europe and America insofar as it seems like nothing works, um, at least to many people. Elites don't work, parliamentary democracies don't work, um, and, and, and it may be that that divergence um, between Europe and America in mid-20th century on, on questions of judicial restraint um, is going to produce a more interesting and um, complicated and troubling conversations. Thank you. Uh, concerning the first one, uh, yeah, I think that, um, uh, as I was saying, uh, the, the the perception that Europeans have of of Scalia is that Scalia indeed is quite European in his um, approach and sensitivity, but some of not all of uh, his um, opinions, but some of them have a style that um, is uh, more, in a way, palatable for Europeans than, than other um, uh, justices. Um, uh, concerning the, the, what exactly is originalism, um, what the law uh, means, what laws, um, w w what's the content of the, co the act of communication that laws incorporate, um, I think that the, this is, as as it was said, uh, 
related to the um, to the, the the constraint the law can actually um, um, uh, can actually um, um, apply to to, uh, to to judges, and I think that uh, it surprisingly, if you read some of the decisions of um, courts like the Italian or the German constitutional court in some um, subject matters like family laws, you will see some originalism there. Even if those courts are so committed uh, to proportionality, as it was remarked um, a few minutes ago, so what I think it's di- very difficult uh, in these kind of exercises is that courts are not always consistent, and so um, it's true that uh, European judges and European courts have for sure a taste for um, uh, living constitutionalism. If you read family laws uh, decisions, there you can find um, quite um, um, quite um, originalist approaches. Um, The uh, last comment about the uh, differences in um, Scalia's uh, context and Kelsen's context, um, all true, and we are aware of that. But at the same time, uh, we also um, found that they both seem worried about the same thing. Uh, Kelsen was preoccupied with um, preserving uh, democratic institutions. Uh, Kelsen was preoccupied with the faith of um, parliamentary uh, democracy. And I think that in in this particular sense, he's, he's really useful uh, for us uh, nowadays. And um, the um, the final remark concerned the 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 um the reference to the preamble of the Austrian constitution uh well it's true it can uh, it can be interpreted as a form of radical populism but what is lying there is the enlightenment thinking is the um there was a clear expression of the enlightenment tradition and the trust um on the rationality of human beings as opposed to the tradition. So these, that form of anti-traditionalism is permeates for sure all European constitutions, but that form of anti-traditionalism is related to the Enlightenment thinking, is related to the rationalist, um, the rationalist sensitivity of uh, European legal culture. Thanks for all the really uh, illuminating comments and useful comments. So let's let's thank Graziella and Andrea. <laughs> Friend.